Hello, my name is Jeffrey Schneider. Uh, I'm a physiatrist at Spalding Rehab Hospital in Boston. And I'll be speaking to you today about uh, uh, experiences developing a COVID recovery clinic, a telerehabilitation approach. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, speak with you all today. So uh, as the COVID pandemic began last spring, um, you know, we just started to learn about some of the problems people were having. And, um, you know, this was um, a slide published by a group um, out in China really describing uh, the burden of uh, disease, you know, in the acute phase and then after the hospitalization. And, you know, in the beginning, we were still trying to distill this out, but I think now we have a better perspective and understanding that, you know, people who uh, have been uh, impacted by COVID-19 and had an infection, often had difficulty in getting back to their uh, functional baseline after um, their acute care hospitalization. And sort of that's the area that uh, we foresaw as an issue that we wanted to address. Um, and, you know, being a physiatrist focused on rehabilitation medicine, um, we felt and foresaw that there would be issues that would be uh, relevant to sort of our domains of care that we could help people with. So uh, this is sort of beginning ideas. You know, soon in the spring, after that in the spring, there started to be some published data. This is data that came out of uh, Italy um, and they followed 143 uh, people who had been hospitalized. Um, at a mean of about 60 days after their, their initial onset of symptoms. And patients were asked to describe um, their symptoms at the acute stage and then at this point 60 days later. And you can see that uh, some of these symptoms really started to persist for a long time. This is a couple of months after the in initial onset, you know, fatigue being the most prominent, 53% of people were describing fatigue. A few months later, dyspnea or a sensation of shortness of breath. Uh, joint pains, chest pain, and you know, over half the population that they examined had three or more symptoms uh, at two months, and uh, you know, almost half of them, 44%, reported worse quality of life. So uh, we're starting to get this picture of you know maybe the longer term needs of the population. Um, meanwhile, here at Spalding Rehab Hospital in Boston, which is an inpatient rehabilitation facility we were beginning to care for uh, people who were uh, severely uh, affected by uh, COVID-19. And uh, many of those people after they survived their hospitalization were not well enough to go home. And some of them ended up coming to our inpatient rehab hospital for, uh, to get them well enough so that we can get them home. And we decided to collect some standardized uh, data uh, at the time they first presented to the rehab hospital and also at discharge. And that sort of was a way to us to get a sense of what issues they were facing and sort of how those issues were recovering over this period of time. And these are a bunch of instruments and I don't need to walk through all the details. This is from a paper that was recently accepted in PLOS One, hasn't yet been published, uh, looking at a measure of balance, uh, 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 a 10 meter walk test and six minute walk test, of sort of walking speed and aerobic capacity, uh, functional independence measure, and then issues of voice swallowing and cognition. And basically what we found across the board is that at presentation to the rehab hospital, there were deficits of this population. There were about 30 patients that were in this initial sample, which was from April and May of um, 2020. Uh, all had deficits across the board in all of these assessments. And then uh, you know, the population as a whole improved, you know, statistically significantly in all of these domains and, and metrics, but for the most part, they did not return to what was considered normal um, in these uh, measures. So that sort of also sort of helped us think about what issues people would face. And then in a, in a bigger picture, we also were thinking about uh, what we can learn since COVID is such a new problem, we didn't really, couldn't pretend the future issues, you know, what we can learn from other patients who've had uh, ICU syndrome, which, you know, are people who had long ICU stays. And there's some good data that's been in the literature the last number of years, looking at, you know, the delay in functional recovery over the span of over a year. Uh, for many uh, people who had ICU syndrome, looking at FIM scores, you know, cognitive impairments over a course of multiple different studies and a significant portion of the population 
um, at one year after uh, ICU stay and chronic fatigue symptoms uh, that persisted in two thirds of a population of ICU patients at a year. So these were also sort of informed our understanding. So this sort of all led to what I'm sort of here to talk to you about today, which we decided to develop a, a COVID recovery program here at Spalding to address you know, the sequelae of COVID-19 initially from hospitalization, people who have been hospitalized, um, and really focusing on the domains that we felt we could, we could um, address, which were really physical issues, cognitive issues, as well as mental health issues. And we assembled a team, a uh, really multidisciplinary group, including physicians, which were mostly physiatrists, a bunch of different therapists, uh, PTs and OTs, uh, clinic coordinators, case managers, and we began to meet, you know, uh, really in March of 2020, um, initially uh, virtually uh, on Zoom calls twice a week to really develop this program. And, you know, I think about uh, my 20 years of in medicine and, and never before I haven't cared for a patient that I never knew nothing about beforehand in terms of, you know, their illness. So we really were all learning as we were doing this. Um, that's kind of what made this particularly interesting, challenging so we initially cared for and designed a, a telemedicine program uh, for physiatrists across our department uh, to care for people who had been hospitalized with COVID-19. And I'll talk about later, we sort of expanded later to, tr to manage people who had mild to moderate disease and had not been hospitalized. Um, and initially everything was by telemedicine and over the, the months that went by, more recent months, some of that has transitioned to in-person or a mix of both telemedicine and in-person visits. And thus far, we've seen almost about 200 patients um, and many more ha have been seen just by our therapists in addition to the ones that have seen by our physician group. Um, this is uh, from an article we published in the journal PMNR uh, in conjunction with colleagues um, in New York City at um, Columbia and Cornell. And you know, we were sort of three of the centers that were um, seeing some of the, the highest proportion of COVID-19 patient, patients in the spring of 2020, as these were the geographic regions that were affected earliest um, uh, in the United States. And we uh, wrote this article really to describe the development of this clinic and also to describe the population of patients we were taking care of. And um, th this was sort of our initial sample in the spring with, um, you know, a, a small sampling of a, a little over 30 patients in each of the centers, um, but describing sort of the, the demographic makeup of the group and, and medical characteristics of the group. And, um, you know, uh, uh, we sort of learned a lot in terms of, you know, our different approaches, and it was helpful to collaborate with uh, uh, groups in New York um, at the time. So when we thought about the issues that the COVID survivors would face, we sort of thought of them in these three main symptom categories, physical symptoms, cognitive and psychological symptoms. And we, um, these are similar to sort of how we thought about uh, post-critical illness impairments uh, in other uh, critical illness populations. You know, functional issues, weakness and balance problems, we anticipated seeing uh, pain and contractures, deconditioning, problems with swallowing. Um, in cognitive areas, we thought about uh, memory and, and uh, concentration and tension issues, slowed mental processing, uh, and then psychologically issues with sleeping as well as depression and anxiety. We developed a, a standardized assessment that we use for all of our initial telemedicine visits. And we wanted to be able to sort of track the, this population over time and, and be at a better understanding, especially since it's a population we had never cared for before, to have a, a standardized way of assessing um, their needs. And so we came up with uh, uh, instruments that we could use over telemedicine, which included um, uh, a measure of exercise capacity, a, a two minute step test, uh, a measure of functional mobility, the 30 second sit to stand test, and then a, a brief uh, examination of cognition, which was the mini MOCA, and uh, an assessment of mood for anxiety and depression symptoms with the PHQ-4. Um, and we found that, you know, we tried to pick uh, assessments that were relatively easy to perform. Uh, we'd give us uh, standardized information that we could uh, look at in real time to uh, identify problems, but also retrospectively to look back at the population as a, as a whole and better understand the issues they were facing. 
you know, uh, as we began taking care of these patients and there were fewer and fewer people hospitalized as uh, we went into the summer months, uh, and we started hearing more and more about people who didn't have a severe acute illness from COVID-19, but had sort of initial mild illness, but had persistent symptoms. And, you know, people have used different terms to describe this group, but, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci came up with this term of post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2 infection, PASC. Um, uh, and so we began to accept patients to our uh, uh, COVID recovery clinic who hadn't been hospitalized. And we found, you know, a host of different uh, persistent symptoms. Um, and these symptoms included things from fatigue, and this is maybe hard to read, but, you know, muscle aches, um, uh, issues with uh, breathing, headaches, um, uh, joint pains, cough, you know, GI symptoms um, to um, uh, cognitive issues. And, you know, in addition to our work working with these, we found that it was very helpful to also sort of collaborate with our colleagues. People had, you know, uh, multi-system problems or complaints in lots of different organ systems. And uh, we ended up developing sort of a network of colleagues uh, in our hospital system to uh, collaborate with clinically, um, you know, in the pulmonary group, uh, ear, nose, and throat, cardiology, neuropsychology to assess cognitive issues that persisted, and also, you know, our, our psychology and social work uh, counseling colleagues for uh, mental health issues. Um, so uh, this was really helpful in sort of our development of this um, clinic. We also noticed that, you know, overall, uh, COVID was having effects on people's lifestyle. Um, you know, stressors, uh, in addition to the sickness and illness itself, stressors that included the, the demands of quarantine, uh, of uh, being exposed or worrying about exposure of other people, uh, isolation, which was really uh, uh, social isolation for many, you know, um, lack of employment and income, uh, People, others might be working from home, having kids at home who are being schooled from home, uh, issues with caregiving. All these things led to, you know, multiple stressors. Uh, people were exercising less, gaining weight, feeling more anxious, not sleeping as well. And so a lot of the interventions we sought were often lifestyle ones, where sort of finding ways to better balance um, the stressors with things we could do to help support uh, people with their recovery. We also collaborated with physical therapists and thinking about uh, the logistics of their therapy regimen and, and coordinating their therapy um, uh, regarding you know, ways of assessing people's um, uh, respiratory capacity and ways that they can monitor it, this at home with home therapy um, uh, and pace themselves and uh, basing a lot of this on some uh, pulmonary rehab literature that um, already existed. You know, and like we mentioned earlier, there were significant psychological sequelae, lots of um, uh, anxiety and depression and mood symptoms. And, you know, one of the things that we uh, did was we, we sort of hearing feedback from the patients we were caring for. And I should just mention that throughout this whole process, we continue to meet a, as a group that planned this uh, program uh, on a regular basis over Zoom up until the stay still. Um, less frequently over time, but still did so. And we actually developed a COVID-19 support group, uh, which met virtually and, and has uh, recently taken off to meet the needs of COVID survivors and their caregivers. And I wanted to sort of end here with sort of the process. And I think that, you know, one of the things we've learned the most from th this COVID telemedicine clinic uh, and the clinic as a whole is that this has been sort of a, a process of you know, planning and designing and trying new things and adjusting them and modifying them over time. For one, because you know, this was a, 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 an illness that was new for us and we were learning about it. Um, the, the way it was presenting and, and where we were learning about it uh, changed over time. Um, and with issues related to public health and sort of the types of patients we were seeing change over time. And so, um, you know, I think that ended up being some of the most uh, dynamic parts of this in, in our ability to uh, adjust and adapt to our learning about uh, COVID uh, sequelae 
and the issues that our patients were facing. Um, and so um, that ended up being one of the keys. And we, like I said, we still meet to this day every other week um, uh, during lunch hour uh, by Zoom with you know the spirit, this planning group that put this clinic together and to keep feedback with each other and learning about the process. I wanted to end here by thanking you for the opportunity to talk today. And I wanted to also thank all of my colleagues that I listed here who were involved across multiple disciplines involved in this uh, COVID recovery clinic, and uh, as well as our, our colleagues, um, uh, Dr. Gelhorn and Hamid in New York City that we collaborated with in developing this clinic from the beginning and, and we bounced uh, ideas off each other. Um, and uh, also left my email here uh, as contact information if you wanna be in touch with me afterwards, I'm happy to uh, connect with you offline. Thank you very much.